Okay, so welcome everyone. So today is a pleasure to introduce uh, to you Philip Strasberg. He's a uh, he's working in in quantum thermalization and quantum non-equilibrium dynamics. At, he's currently located at uh, Universidad Autónoma of Barcelona, and he has a, a prestigious La Caixa Grant Junior uh, Junior Leader uh, Grant. And well, uh, Philip uh, did his PhD with Tobias Brandes in Berlin, and then he was in Luxembourg for a postdoctoral uh, period, and, and then he landed at the University of Barcelona, where he's working since the last five years. So today he's going to present his latest research on very fundamental topics that are always very interesting and, and nice to learn about. So please, Philip. Yes. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. Oh, I think you have to enable screen sharing. I have to give you a... Uh, uh, okay. That's a good start already, but... <laughs> no, um, yeah, we should have checked that. Actually, I, I kind of... I, I never host these uh, meetings. Uh, I think it's where the share screen button is. There should be a little arrow, and then you can click and give me more rights. Or, okay. um, Let me see. Uh, see anyway, is it participants? Maybe there. So I, and the arrow. I made you a host. Philip, ah, can you share? Okay. That? Um. Yes. Now you. Let's see. Um. Yeah. Now you should see the slides on full screen, right? Yes. Okay. Um. All right. Oops. Let me go back. Sorry. So then let's start. Um. Yeah. I'm very happy to be here and looking forward to your uh, comments later on. So I, in my recent work, started to look at, say, the quantum to classical transition from the perspective more of isolated uh, quantum systems than open quantum systems. And most recently also tried to get a more, say, quantitative understanding of many worlds. And in my background is more statistical physics. So you might ask, OK, how, why can I tell you something about this uh, topic? But my, my main goal of this talk is to convince you that I can actually tell you something about it and that there's much uh, stuff we can study using tools from statistical mechanics. And before I start, let me just acknowledge a few co-workers. So most of the stuff I'm going to talk about was done recently with uh, Teresa Reiner and Joseph Chindler in, in Barcelona. But initially kind of this thing started more or less by chance in some sense, uh, by collaborating with Jochen Gemma and Josi Wang from um, Osnabrück in Germany and, and Andreas Winter in Barcelona. All right, so this talk has three main parts. Uh, first, I will just set the stage and tell you what many worlds interpretation means. And I will introduce something like a history formalism with which I will work today. And then, uh, I will basically address, say, the two most important problems associated with the many worlds interpretation, and I will explain them later on, and then I conclude. Good. So, so what's the many worlds interpretation? And uh, just to be clear, I, I only talk about non-relativistic quantum mechanics today. And then all what the many worlds interpretation says is that, well, you have some big isolated system, which you call the universe. Uh, this is a Hamiltonian age, and there's a wave function psi, and that's it, okay? So it's really a very minimal framework, which promises that, you know, this is sufficient to make sense out of quantum mechanics. And so far, I think that's just a promise. So people haven't agreed on that this actually works, and we will talk about uh, some of the big problems. Um, but I think Due to its simplicity, it really attracts attention uh, nowadays. Now, 
what is one of the consequences of starting from these axioms only? Well, I've tried to sketch it here and uh, well, I assume everybody knows quantum mechanics in this audience, so I don't need, need to explain the Schrodinger cat experiment. But the main point of this slide is just to say that, uh, you know, once you start with some microscopic superposition, this basically can, you know, get amplified and spread to macroscopic degrees of freedom. And at the end of the day, you end up with a wave function like that one here, which really describes the superposition of macroscopically distinct um, yeah, properties or, or objects. And, and all this follows from the linearity of the Schrodinger equation. So one point I just want to make is actually that this kind of multiverse that people like to talk about really is a prediction of the many worlds framework and not a postulate, okay? And I think that's important to mention because I think there's some confusion that people think many worlds postulates all these many different worlds, but it really comes out of the formalism in principle. Now, how can you think about, you know, the unitarily evolving uh, multiverse and how to define branches and all that? And I think there are different possibilities, but I like to use one framework, which I, which is called the histories framework, and which got a lot of attention in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. And how is this constructed? So... Let's start just at T0. You have an isolated system. There's some um, wave function of it, all right? And then you want to investigate certain properties of your system. And as usual, you describe properties of a quantum system by a complete set of orthogonal projectors. Um, so what I will do now is I just take the state and multiply it um, with a sum over all these projectors, pi x or x zero here. And as I said, this is a complete set of uh, orthogonal projectors. So the sum over all projectors is actually an identity, okay? So I'm doing nothing but multiplying the state with an identity matrix. So there's no collapse or measurement happening. Um, and basically all what this does is in some sense, it takes my Hilbert space and it divides it into different subspaces to which I associate certain properties. Now next, my system evolves unitarily uh, up to the next time, uh, T1. And then I repeat and I insert again, uh, basically an identity matrix, uh, sum over these projectors. And I continue with that um, until some final time when I, when I stop basically. And what this allows me is basically like what you can see here, it basically tracks different components of the wave function as I evolve uh, through Hilbert space, where I basically keep track of basically what ha what's happening with respect to these projectors. And now what you can do is basically you can take the summation symbol all out to the left, and then you can write down your, your state at time Tn the superposition of the states psi of x, where basically this state denotes everything except of the um, summation symbols. And a bold phase x is what I call a history and which basically denotes a sequence of all those labels here, okay? So if you see this construction, uh, you might be reminded of the pass integral. And in fact, if you would look at position, as your cost graining as a set of projectors. And if you would let, uh, if you let the, uh, the time between two points go to zero, then you would literally end up with a pass integral. So this is kind of, you could also call it a generalized pass integral um, approach. And I will use this in my talk. And I think now is actually a good point also if there's any confusion or something unclear just about the basic mathematical formalism, uh, you could ask me now before I continue. If not, <clears throat> I hope everything is clear. And I want to talk about the first problem, which is sometimes uh, called the preferred basis problem. And basically it means, okay, um, so our experience tells us that we live in a 
classical world. We don't have to worry about measurement back, back action. We don't see Schrodinger's cats, and you know we have we can use classical reasoning and logic uh, very well. So how can it be that this kind of giant coherent superposition of this global wave function uh, does not induce any kind of quantum effects in our everyday life? That's the basic question. And I think the the general answer to that is also pretty clear. This is the coherence theory. Um, However, there are certain like different variants of the coherence theory, and I will actually talk about one today, which is different from the common environmentally induced decoherence picture. But I emphasize that everything what I say is uh, basically compatible with environmentally induced decoherence. But I think these kind of different perspective that I will try to talk about basically opens up with you know. A different angle of looking at things, and I think it deserves a bit more attention. Okay, so how do I define decoherence or what more classicality um, based on this histories framework? Well, um, basically, what people have worked out or, or said uh, what decoherence is is the following condition. So you take these um, pure states, which are conditioned on some history. And you look at the overlap of this state with another state conditioned on a different history, and you demand that this scalar product is much, much smaller than the norms of these uh, vectors taken separately. So I, I hope you see that by, by Cauchy-Schwarz, I mean, this left-hand side is always smaller than the right-hand side, but you demand that it's much, much smaller. Another question is, okay, um, why should this have anything to do with classicality? Um, and I tried to make this a bit more intuitive uh, now, although one could definitely talk about this for for much longer time. So the first point I want to make is um, by comparing this basically with how you would think about uh, quantum interference at a single time, if you have a state which is a superposition of two different states, right? And you would compute, say, the probability to measure x uh, using the state. And then if you plug this in, you see that at the end, uh, you get four terms. And there are these diagonal terms where you have basically phi 1, pi x, phi 1, which gives rise to this term and the second diagonal term. And then you have these cross terms, right? And now what people would say is that the first two terms, they are classical and the second part here is um, are quantum terms. Why? Well, because if you would replace the state by a density matrix, which is just a mixture of these states and not a coherent superposition, then these two terms would remain there unchanged and these terms would completely vanish, right? And somehow this condition, so if we go back basically here, allows you to replace um, this coherent superposition basically by a statistical mixture in some sense of these uh, states, as long as you ask only questions about, you know, which, which correspond to these kind of projectors here. That's the first motivation. And the second point I want to make is, and well, that's very subtle and I, I like to discuss this well, in principle. I would love to discuss it for a long time, but I, I don't have a long, uh, such so much time now. So um, so if you think about how we talk about the world, for instance, then you probably notice that we often use certain constructions in our language, certain conditionals, like, oh, if this happened yesterday, then this will happen. Or suppose that this and this happens, then this and this follows, right? And all these kind of conditional sentences actually within a unitarily evolving system, they're not well defined. Because, you know, if, if nobody did a measurement at some point and told you what the outcome was, um, it's not clear how to actually define conditional probabilities. And that's much related also to um, Einstein's famous question, who asked, okay, um, is a moon there when nobody looks? Uh, to basically, yeah, illustrate this point. 
Now, what you can show and what I cannot show you here in detail, but I hope it makes kind of sense is that when this condition is satisfied, then really conditional probabilities or basically classical logic, if you want, can really be applied uh, within this unitarily evolving quantum universe. And I hope this was enough motivation why this could be a good uh, choice for classicality. So now the question is, this is just a formal definition, of course, when actually is this condition satisfied? And here, basically, the theory we have, which tells you that you should observe the coherence the following. So you have to look at a many-body system, ideally a non-integrable many-body system. So there have to be many degrees of freedom. And you should look at a observable, which is coarse and slow. And I will explain this a bit more in detail soon. But once you have these ingredients, then the process which describes these coarse and slow observables will look classical. And actually, this was um, said very clearly by, by this guy here. And I wanted to ask you whether anybody knows who this is. So if you want, you can just write a name in the chat. Um, so so let me know if, if you know uh, who that physicist is. Does anybody know? You can also write don't know. No idea, yes. <laughs> I can make a wild guess, but he's going to be yeah. a random Wild guess are allowed. So what is your wild guess? Weissman? No, how was this? Uh, Weidman? No. Ah, no, it's not Lev Weidman. No. Okay. It's a much older guy. He's already dead. Okay, so let me um, it's not reveal. It's not von Neumann, right? No, it's not von Neumann. It doesn't look like von Neumann from, from the from a physical appearance. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, yeah. But actually, it's another person called Nico van Kampen, and he said this in 1954. Um, I'm not sure whether you know van Kampen. I mean, he was a big statistical physicist, and he has this very pedagogic and very nice book about stochastic processes. And, and he said this very clearly, actually, um, although he was not able to give like a rigorous mathematical proof and obviously couldn't do any numerics but but this idea is actually there in this paper before people even talked about decoherence in many worlds in principle okay so now here's an example to explain what i mean by these kind of strange terms so this is a cup of hot coffee as you all know and in statistical physics well how would you describe this while well, you would say okay there's a cup of hot coffee and this is inside a room and there are lots of uh, molecules in the air. So let's assume the room together with a cup is an isolated system. And obviously it's a many body system, it's also non-integrable. And now the energy or the temperature of this cup, uh, of this coffee um, is, I claim, a coarse and slow observable. And I think that's fairly obvious because it's coarse well, because if you sense the temperature of the coffee with your tongue, you don't learn much about the microscopic state of the system. And it's also slow because we know that our coffee cools down on a minute time scale uh, compared to, say, the femtosecond time scale with which like individual molecules in the coffee collide with each other. Okay. So I, I won't make it more quantitative than this. <laughs> Uh, but I hope you have a rough idea of what I mean by cause and slow observable. And, and the idea is that these observables are exactly those that look classical to us. So, uh, Philip, one could say course is equivalent to weak measurement in a sense, or <clears throat> would be the same idea or is something else? Um, I don't know enough about weak measurements, but I think what is important is that your Hilbert space, there are many different orthogonal states which would give rise to the same measurement outcome. Yes. Basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a weak measurement, actually, I would say. Yeah. All right. Yeah, then um then probably you're right. And um, what I talked to bit today only about is say about kind of projective measurements where you like, you know, cause grain your Hilbert space into orthogonal subspaces. Mm -hmm. But it's probably interesting to consider uh 
what how far everything can be applied to to weak measurements or in general POVMs and other things. Um, right. Okay. So as I said, I mean, Van Kamp basically said that these things should be true, and he tried to kind of argue for it, and I think he did it quite nicely. But um, I really wanted to do it more quantitatively and really check it out. So one thing I actually did is um, to basically kind of really numerically simulate these decoherent histories by just exact solution of the Schrodinger equation to see what comes out. Um, and, and this I did in this kind of recent paper. And in some sense, the model system we use is like a cup of hot coffee coupled to some environment because we consider two systems and uh, there are certain microscopic energy levels in each system. And we couple them weekly via some random matrix. Uh, and why do we choose a random matrix? Because you know random matrix theory is kind of known to model well complex dynamics. So, so that's what we use. Um, and then in each system, we basically measure locally the energy, but in a coarse grained way. So this is here by these long lines. Uh, indicated. So we divide the entire space into, say, three subspaces, and then we look basically at how energy flows in the system. Um, a few more technical details. Actually, in this study, we started from a high random state confined to some microcanonical subspace. So we basically start at equilibrium, if you want. And then to define these histories, uh, I hope you remember that you, know, you had to insert these projectors at certain times. And the time we choose is basically, is a, say, a non-equilibrium time scale. So it's really, if you would start out of equilibrium, this is really something uh, where, where things happening. So we are not inserting times at very long intervals, but rather short ones. And then we want to study this kind of decoherence. We want to see whether this term here is much smaller than the term below here. And of course, there are many terms because you have these trajectories X and Y or these histories. So we just average over all those histories, which is indicated here. And, and that's important. So this average does not mean an average over the random matrices or over the high random states. It's just the average over different histories to get an overall decoherence measure, okay? And now we plot this and here are four plots. Let me go through them uh, a bit in detail. So the difference between these four plots is that we change the total length of the history. So first we just take two time steps, then three, four, and five. And we plot this average decoherence over the Hilbert space dimension. Everything is in logarithmic scale. And each of the blue crosses is basically corresponds to choosing one random matrix and one high random state and um, propagating it and evaluating um, this kind of decoherence measure. And then we repeat this again, choose another random matrix and so on and so forth. So this generates all these different blue crosses. And as you can see, the first thing is that you see some kind of uh, clustering, so there's some kind of typicality. So most uh, realizations, they happen, they give you the same amount of decoherence. So, you know, they're basically all on top of each other. And that motivates to put one fit, like one line through it, which is this red line where we just fit a linear plot here. And then from this, we extract how the decoherence actually scales with the Hilbert space dimension. And we get some kind of scaling law where basically this decoherence is suppressed with more or less one over the square root of the Hilbert space dimension. And if you recall that the Hilbert space dimension scales exponentially with the number of particles, you basically get an exponential suppression of these interference effects, okay? Well, that's just a numerical result, but I think it's pretty clear and evident what's going on here. Um, just to mention, we did a bunch of other cross checks. Uh, I won't go into the details here. And if you're more interested in the bigger physical picture of our model, at least that's what we kind of claim, but it's just a toy model. But you know, remember we start with a high random state, so we start with an equilibrium state. But then what we actually observe is that you have all these different histories, and in some histories, for instance, suddenly there's a 
creation of an energy imbalance. So you get some kind of emergent errors of time or Boltzmann brains, if you like. Um, even though everything is within a, say, equilibrated and globally time reversal symmetric multiverse. And I think that's uh, kind of nice and we can discuss more uh, later on. Um, I just want to finish this part that there's also some analytical support available for the results that uh, I presented you. Namely, what we computed is these kind of mini histories where you start with the same state x0, but then you pass through different states in the middle and you end up with the same state. So it's a little bit like a double slit experiment. And we looked again at the big isolated quantum system and for slow and coarse observables. And then what we estimate is that this really goes down with one over the Hilbert space dimension where alpha is some exponent, which is not universal, but it, which is you know of the order of one, like one half or something like that. And I just wanted to mention it um, because I'm very proud of these <laughs> calculations because when you will check out these references, you will actually see that it takes me several pages uh, to, to arrive at this kind of conclusion. And it actually would be nice to have a more solid and more general mathematical arguments showing this kind of scaling behavior of, of the uh, interference effects of these uh, histories. Okay. This was all I wanted to show you about how classicality merges in general about the scaling law. Um, if there's any question, just let me know. Um, if not, um, let me talk about the second big problem associated to the many worlds interpretation. And that's also known as the probability problem. And that's related to asking, okay, if I have this you know, deterministically evolving wave function, what does it actually mean to talk about uncertainty, probability, and where does Born's rule come from within this um, picture? Um, is, is there a question? I think somebody has a mic left on. I think you are uh, you have your <laughs> microphone. Maybe he's not hearing us. Ah, oh, no. Okay. All right. So that's the probability problem. And where's I, I said for this kind of preferred basis problem, the general answer is decoherence. And I think there are many, you know, subtle open questions remaining, but nobody doubts that decoherence explains classicality, I think. Um, the general answer for the probability problem is completely unknown. There's absolutely no consensus. Um, so I will now basically try to explain what it is about. Um, and then I will give you some evidence, which I find very remarkable, but which probably also doesn't solve the probability problem, but I think which is worth considering and which hasn't been, I think, considered so far. So let's start slowly. Let's think about you are in this quantum mechanical multiverse and you want to kind of, say, confirm uh, the probability of some observable of some you know binary measurement. And how would you do this? Well, you would set up an experiment and repeat, you know, many times, measure again and again. And what you get is this kind of exponentially uh, branching tree, which I have sketched here. So you start somehow, you measure, you know, what, whatever property you want, you get zero or one, and then you're in one branch or the other, and you repeat and you get then all these sequences and so on and so forth, right? And now, one thing you can do is you can just count the number of branches and ask, okay, how many branches are there where I have, say, n times measured one, okay? And then what you will see is, because each time you split, um, this distribution is always a simple binomial coefficient. So here, capital L is the total number of measurements you do. And this is always symmetrically centered about around L over two, just by counting, you know, the branches you know, which you have here, right? 
And now you see there's a problem because if you note now, like consider this not from an inside perspective, but from an outside perspective where you set up this experiment and you, you know, repeatedly measure using Born's rule and whatsoever, then the distribution you get should look like this, which is a binomial distribution where P1 would be the probability that you measure um, one in a single trial of the experiment. And now if P1 is 0.5, 50%, well, then these two curves, I basically would agree and everything is fine. But we know that we can, for instance, prepare a system in a superposition where P1 is say three over four, um, and then these curves no longer coincide. And the question is, how do you make sense of this Born's rule in a multiverse when you're not allowed to use Born's rule, basically? That's, that's the probability problem. Now, there has been a long list of attempts where people try to solve um, uh, this problem. And I will not review them at all. Um, I just mentioned a few things. So first of all, you can see already that the proposed solutions uh, to this problem, they all differ very widely and there's no agreed on consensus on which is the right one. And in addition, of course, what I didn't list here, but there are also many counter arguments and many people remain unconvinced that any of these uh, solutions is the right one. And I'm also kind of a little bit skeptical here. Um, and, and I mean, you know, they are all very intelligent and, and, and brilliant proposals, but I think they all kind of have an outside perspective and rely on additional axioms. And as I said here, what I tried to explain is that the problem is really when you are inside the multiverse, you know, then you just measure one trajectory. And the question is, okay, why should you ever end up on a trajectory um, uh, which is likely to obey Born's rule? And and to appreciate the, the difficulty of the problem, um, it is maybe good to recall the title of Everett's original paper where he introduced the many worlds interpretation. And this was called relative state formulation of quantum mechanics. Because what he said is, okay, you as an observer, all what you know is, say, the relative state compatible with your observations, but you cannot know all the other branches. So you only see your own branch. And, and you, you do not even know the coefficient in front of the branches. And these coefficients are the ones which determine Born's rule. But, but you know, what do they mean to you if you are on one branch where you have no access at all to these kind of coefficients? Okay. So that's a kind of subtle problem one needs to solve um, and which can easily drive you crazy. Uh, at least it drove me crazy. And I thought, okay, but if you want to talk about these things, well, then maybe it's good to have you know, to really know what's going on and to look at some kind of very idealized frequency experiment where we really carry on this experiment for a long, long time. So we have a, um, a large L, many repetitions, and we see or we, we look what ha what's happening to, say, the decoherence along these branches, okay? So this is what I tried to do in my, my last work here. Um, to really check how does the decoherence behave if you look at histories with many, many time steps. And the first problem you see now is immediately because you have this branching at each time. So this tree grows exponentially. So if L is very large, you could not even store all these different histories. But you can use a little trick. And what we do is the following. So <clears throat> first of all, we just look at this binary case, which I just showed you. So there's zero or one. These are you know, the two projectors, which uh, decompose your Hilbert space into orthogonal subspaces. So any Hamiltonian can be written in this kind of uh, block structure. And that's not yet any assumption here. But now what we use again is to say, okay, H0 and H11, these are simple diagonal matrices, but we couple them with some weak random matrix to, to make them interact. 
So it's a very primitive model in some sense. I'm not claiming that it's really describing any kind of realistic experiment. But as you will see, it has some kind of actually um, some resemblance or analogy with a with a frequency experiment that you could do in a lab. So now this doesn't prevent this exponential growing of the number of histories. But now what we actually look at, and that's a real trick, we consider those histories where we just keep track of the net number of ones along one sequence. So we basically lump together all histories where you have the same number n of um, of ones. And then suddenly you see that n only runs from 0 to L. So you have reduced this exponential scaling to something where you just have to store basically something which goes linearly with L. Okay. And now to quantify the coherence among these branches, we use the same expression as always. But now we don't take an average over all n and m, but we fix n and maximize over all the different m's. And why do we do that? Well, because we say like, okay, inside the multiverse, you're on one branch um, with a given n. And if you know if if you want to basically have a classical world, then what you should ensure is that you are decohered from all the other branches. So we take kind of a worst case scenario and look what is the uh, biggest amount of coherence you can get with another branch M, basically, when we look at this. Okay. So before I show some plots, you know, just, you know, let me repeat, let me be clear again. So we end this kind of picture um, where you have all these different branches. We just count the net number of zeros or ones. And now, what we want to capture is that you know before each measurement, we basically want to say re-prepare the system and ensure that you have the same probability for measuring zero or one. And in our very naive simple toy model, we ensure this by choosing the times at which we evaluate this decoherence functional to be of the order of the equilibration time. And this I have sketched here. So basically, here's a trajectory where we just look at the expectation of being in one of the states uh, conditioned on some branch. So we start here and we start in equilibrium and equilibrium here is 50-50. We just remain there and then, for instance, we would measure one, then suddenly, okay, we are in one. But then we leave enough time to actually relax back to equilibrium and then we measure again, that would be a zero and so on and so forth. And the probability, if you wait always for the equilibration time, to get outcome one actually by using standard methods of statistical mechanics and typicality, you know, you can show that this is a trace of this projector. So the dimension of the subspace of the Hilbert space, which is compatible with this result, divided by uh, the total Hilbert space dimension. Okay, so that's basically the expectation value of pi one in the microcanonical ensemble, if you want. Okay, so that's what we do. So at these times, we evaluate this decoherence functional now. Um, and this is what I will show you now at the, at the end. And here's, first of all, a plot where I just want to explain the quantities that we plot, um, to be clear. So we have a small Hilbert space dimension total, 250. We look at 25 time steps, uh, which is not so much what, 25, say, repetitions in our experiment. And the blue circles, this is this epsilon n. So it's a measure of decoherence or coherence, if you want. So if this is one, it's very strong coherence. If it's zero, it's perfect decoherence, okay? And in this plot, I show you also two more figures. So um, the first thing I show you is basically uh, this kind of scalar product of psi n with itself. So, you know, if you would use a Born's rule, this is just the probability to get n times outcome one. These are these black stars, okay? And and that's the full probability of the full unitarily evolved uh, wave function. Um, this probability is basically what you would say, if you are right with saying that this is kind of a frequency experiment where we do repeated 
trials of, of the same system, basically, then you would expect this kind of binomial distribution, right? Um, where you have this P1 appearing and this binomial coefficient, and this is this purple solid line, okay? So these are the three things we, we display here. Um, and now what I do first, or what we did first, is to scale up the Hilbert space dimension. Now it's a factor 100 larger, it's 25,000. It's still only 25 repeated trials. And you can see two things. So first of all, the blue curve, the blue dots, they go down. So you have much stronger decoherence and that's just compatible with the scaling law I told you. Um, and you also see that these black stars, you know, tend to cluster around the blue purple uh, line. So it's kind of, we start to sample like a process where we, where it really looks like an independent uh, frequency trial or repeated experiment. And now we increase the number of repetitions in our say fictitious experiment. So we go to 250, still for the small Hilbert space band dimension. And now you see already a kind of nice structure emerging. So you see that if you are away from where you expect the probability to be, basically you get very strong coherence, strong interference effects, um, and things remain decoherent more or less only there where um, basically most of the probability sits. And the picture becomes even more impressive now if you go to 25,000, then you see first of all that the black stars perfectly sample the, the purple line, so you're really this kind of naive model of modeling things with a, you know, independent trials with the binomial distribution becomes accurate. And you really see extremely strong coherences away from that regime. And basically the picture is that if you have these strong coherence and in these kind of worlds or branches, you couldn't form any records and they couldn't basically, no observer would find evidence of these kind of, um, outcomes and you can only form reliable records if you have a lot of decoherence where you would then find observers who happen to confirm Born's rule uh, statistically here. Now <clears throat> this was done for a 50-50 splitting so if I go back p1 was one half and so uh, this trace of the projector was half the Hilbert space dimension and if you remember, the 50-50 splitting is actually where there's no real problem um, and where Born's rule coincides with the naive counting of the branches in the many worlds tree. So now what I will just present you at the end is one situation where this is 80%. So we make one Hilbert space much larger than the other Hilbert space. And then the figure we get is, is this one. So everything is shifted now here because you measure way more often a one. Uh, we look at 250 time steps or repetitions, say, of the experiment. Um, and you see for 25,000, this is a black stars and purple line again. So you see this, you know, Born's rule basically emerging and that we really sample an independent process. And if you look at the coherence, now in one plot, we compare the 25,000 and 250 case and you basically see more or less the same picture as before. So you only have coherence along a uh, decoherence along the branches, which basically sample Born's rule, and the other ones have very strong uh, coherences or interferences. And that's basically all. That's all the numerical evidence we have. I think it's quite interesting and intriguing, um, uh, but it's say, unclear whether it solves really um, the probability problem and the question, where does Born's rule come from? Okay, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I hope I have one minute left to um, explain my conclusion slide um, where I try to put everything together. So, um, as I told you, more or less since actually quite a long time, it's clear that when you look at cores and slow observables of a many-body system, they should behave classical. It's actually 
somewhat an open question whether you need non-integrability or not. Um, I think there's no definite answer yet. And now here on the left-hand side, or in the middle of the picture, I have tried to sketch what people say we're mostly working on. And this was this picture of environmentally induced decoherence, where you look at the density matrix of an open quantum system and realize that this becomes quickly diagonal in some preferred pointer basis. But if you think about it, the density matrix is just a single time object, right? So from knowing the density matrix, you cannot compute um, correlation functions. So actually, you know, if L denotes the number of repetitions or time steps or whatever, where you define your, your histories, then environmental induced decoherence really just tells you something about a single time step. And then I think what people thought, mostly implicitly, but sometimes they were explicit about it, is to say like, well, but if I understand it for one time step, it will you know, continue to hold for many time steps. So they use some kind of Markovian thinking. And what you then end up with is what I would call naive branch realism, where you just say, oh, I have all these branches, this exponentially growing tree of all the possibilities. And it doesn't matter how bizarre things are and you know, how small the chances, but you know, there's always one universe or one world within the multiverse where even the most bizarre things happening because they are all equally real and they're all equally decoherent. Now, what I tried in my recent work is to make this a bit more quantitative. And I used a different approach, these kind of decoherent histories. And as I said, they are not contradicting or conflicting with this picture. But I think they are a bit more more natural language to look at many uh, multi-time or many-time um, correlation functions. And then here in this first paper, um, in, in bold phase, what we found is if L is small, so if you're for, for a few time steps, you really get this uh, picture where everything everywhere all at once happens, uh, like in this famous Hollywood movie. So you really have this picture and you get um, the suppression of uh, coherence with a Hilbert space dimension. So you have this scaling law, which analytically is a bit more explored in these uh, two papers up here. But then kind of things start to change if you go to large L and you suddenly see that no longer all branches remain equally decoherent, um, but there are just a few selective branches which remain decoherent. So there's some kind of emergent structure and it's no longer true that you know everything happens uh, somewhere if you want. And the kind of same mysterious observation was that exactly the surviving branches sample Born's rule. But to be honest, I'm very skeptical that this provides a general explanation of, of Born's rule. Um, it's way too simple. Um, but at least I think it's a very curious observation that has you know never been made um, before. And that was basically all. Um, I just wanted to advertise my own blog, <laughs> which I started just a few months ago. So if you want, uh, please feel free to read it or leave a comment. And I'm very happy to take uh, any sorts of questions uh, and, and comments from you. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Philip. It was very interesting, actually. I think I I personally have a lot of questions because this is a very interesting topic, but let me first see if any anyone else from the group wants to ask something. Yeah, maybe I, I would like you to repeat a little bit this argumentation where you try to separate the city matrix language from the trajectories one. Are, are they really reconcilable? I mean, one can think that both possibilities are coexisting in a way. Your histories could be the density matrix that happens through those paths and, and your 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 selection yeah. is a way of finding the pointer states in a way. That exactly, are... yeah. Okay, so yeah. They, they're not orthogonal descriptions in a way, no? They, you, you could join come mentally that, that the language that reconciles both images. Yes, so, so I think both are kind of like a different angle of looking at the problem, but the basic picture you get out is similar, right? So 
For the decoherent histories, of course, you could choose projectors, as you said, on, on the pointer states of your open quantum system. You don't have to, but, but you can do it. And then, for instance, you will also see, you know, this is also true for this environmental induced decoherence. So, for instance, um, if we look at an open system very weakly coupled to a bus, then open quantum system theory tells you that the energy eigenstates of your system become the pointer states. So you basically coherences and energy eigenbases are suppressed. And if you think about it, well, if you have weak coupling between a system and a bus, the energy of your system is really the slow observable because this cannot change very quickly because of the weak coupling, right? And it's also caused because you trace out the entire bus, uh, which has lots of degrees of freedom. So in that sense, I think there's a lot of similarity, but actually like say rigorously connecting every single dot and translating is actually not so easy and partially still open. Um, but I think for me, these are like different tools and perspectives to talk about the same uh, problem in physics. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think what well, my uh, I I like a lot the the this picture that you have showed here, the last slide uh, where you use, you talk about this emergent structure of the bonds rule. Actually, I kind of surprised that you are so skeptical that this is an explanation for the bonds rule because for me it's I mean it's pretty clear that this kind of I mean, in essence, if, if you look from a quantum optics perspective, for us, the Born's rule is, is can be understood as the, the working of a, of a detector, if you want. So you have a, it's actually detection or measurement is a physical process. It's, it's not necessarily a, a rule that is embedded in quantum mechanics, but you can think of it as, as, a, as a physical process that happens with the physical apparatus and you can, if you try to describe uh, a measurement, then the picture that I have in mind always is the one that you are showing here. I mean, you have a detector has different, can be in different states. And these states are orthogonal, which uh, is related to the condition for classicality that you are showing somehow. Mm -hmm. So this would be a kind of a stream case where, where the, the different measurement outcomes correspond to different trajectories. That are totally orthogonal to each other, and thus is uh, is basically what you show here in, the, in this picture. So I don't know if uh, yeah, that, does it make sense somehow that you can you think of the born Born's rule as something that that is is basically the uh, the prediction of what a, a detector is going to do? Then this would be it's more or less. Would you say yes? Yeah. Um, let me first stop sharing the screen, then maybe it's more personal. <laughs> then I can see you. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you for for the encouraging work words. I mean, I would be happy if that would be the general explanation. Um, mm -hmm. The point is, of course, I mean, we have a very simple toy model, right? It's basically what we sample is, and I mean, everything is fully unitary. Everything is a pure state always, yeah. but. We just sample basically some equilibrated process in some sense. Mm -hmm. Um, like if you think about what people do in a lab, say when you do when they do quantum state tomography, right? They have their qubit and prepared in a superposition, and then they couple and read out, and then they reprepare again. <laughs> I mean, this is a kind of different category of models, and I'm not sure whether um what what I've shown you here would apply to this as well, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. Well, that's a. It's always under debate, but I, I think that after all, you, you have a you have a quantum system, and then you have a measurement apparatus, which is also a quantum system. And if you think of it as a whole, then yeah. and you apply your ideas, then you should understand the quantum measurement as basically a, a trajectory where the different stories are very separated because the quantum measurement is, uh, the apparatus is, is a very, it has very distinct states and depending on the measurement outcome, they are very orthogonal to each other. So that, that's why if you think of the whole lab, so to say, as a quantum system, 
then it would be more or less. I don't know. That doesn't make sense to you. No, no. I mean, you're right. This is exactly the picture we want to yeah. convey in some sense because we say, okay, you know, this lab is a completely horrible, complicated object. That's why we use random matrix theory. And all what matters is that you can distinguish between two states in your detector, zero, one, and then we see what happens. Um, still, I think it's, you know, a lot of debate about Born's rule and there's lots of mm -hmm. ingenious arguments. So <laughs> I think it's good to be a bit more careful. Um, in particular, I think like one thing I, which is much say, harder to address. So, so now we had this kind of idea that you do a frequency experiment in time, right? You have the same system and you re-prepare. And I think this matches many things like quantum state tomography. But you could also think instead of doing sequentially things in time, you really have an ensemble of different systems all prepared identically, but decorrelated. And you just measure each system once, right? Mm -hmm. So you do everything in parallel at a single time. And then you should also get Born's rule. But then what we say is not at all applicable because there's just a single time. It's, you know, a one-time measurement. And it's not clear how Born's rule would emerge there. Now, of course, what you could question is whether it's actually, you know, because we live in one universe and there are always microscopic correlations. So how is it actually possible to really prepare systems in a decorrelated way and to ensure that the all the detectors are simultaneously decorrelated and um but at least it's kind of an example where i'm not sure whether a similar argument holds i'm i mean i i don't know so 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 the general picture which comes a bit out here is to say like um that decoherence i mean it looks very robust but if you go to very like systems with many um like if you go to many measurement outcomes it becomes kind of fragile on, on certain branches which suddenly start to have more coherence than you would think mm -hmm. and yeah i think it's a fair point it's a nice point but uh, well, well i really think we we'll need to study it more to have any kind of conclusions so. no i understand there are many subtleties so there are some points that well this I, I should have to think more about these these things i mean i, I understand is my intuition is that the what you show it makes sense but you're right that there are many things to be i mean the other thing that i wanted to ask is you are showing these two models and these calculations like the last result that you that you showed where yes. you have these toy models and and I wonder whether these things can be, uh, these models can be implemented in a more, in a better defined way in many body systems, like quantum chains and so on. This is something that, yes, to, to make like more physical predictions on, on real systems. So, I mean, this is something that we can, maybe if you come to Madrid at some point, we could talk about uh, sure. a little bit yeah. because it's very, but I think this would be also be nice because this way you could connect to other experiments, maybe or do simulation yeah. stuff. No, you're right. Um, well, I have three short remarks. I mean, we do random matrix theory because I'm not very good with numerics, and that's something I can handle. <laughs> it's kind of very straightforward, kind of to to do it. Um, the second remark is in this paper with a. Uh, collaborators from Osnabrück, this PIA, we actually also do numerics, and there we look at a spin chain. Uh -huh. And the observables we consider is the spin density wave operator, which we call grain. And there, I mean, we did not, I mean, it has some overlap with decoherent histories, but we did not evaluate exactly this decoherence condition that I showed you. Rather, we evaluated a consequence of that and yeah. looked whether there are any violations. But it's very close. And there, um, we also found that things look classical, um, and the more spins you take, the more classical things become. Mm -hmm. um, but but this paper was not only about classicality, but also about stuff related to the second law and Markovianity. So actually, we checked quite a bunch of things. So we don't have a, such a detailed study of this quantum classical transition. 
Mm -hmm. But at least there we have a model which is really a spin chain. And, uh, uh -huh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. and then the third thing, like experimentally, I was thinking like the hard problem, of course, is that you have to do things at multiple times um, without destroying your sample, right? So I mean, now with, with cold atoms, when they do their measurements and the sample is gone because they, I don't know what they do. Um, and then they have to re-prepare the entire thing. So to test these kind of things in an experiment, you really need to be able at least once to do a measurement in the middle and then the system continues running. Okay. And mm -hmm. then you do a final measurement and then you compare this with the same system, but without the measurement in the middle, basically. And then you can see whether the measurement actually has an influence on your final statistics. And if you have decoherence, you wouldn't expect that this is the case. Yeah, no, but this, well, this is quite natural. For example, with quantum optical systems like protons or ah, okay. superconducting circuits where you you access the system, if you have two level systems and you continuously monitor them optically by measuring the, the emitted light, for example, then you would you have uh, the kind of system that you that you okay. Like you, a continuously monitored system where you can, you can monitor the system or not monitor it, and then you, yeah, this would be very, very easy to do. Okay. Strat ion simulators is very natural. Okay. Well, that's definitely worth to discuss in Madrid or so. Yeah. That's... Okay. Very mm -hmm. nice. I think uh, for us it's time for lunch now. So I think. Me uh, too. I would like to thank you again. This was really a very interesting, a very interesting talk, and you are. I think it's a, it's a very nice uh, research that you are you are doing. Yeah, so, thanks a lot, and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. I was very happy you know, to be here. Okay. Okay. Thank cool. you guys. Thank See you soon, and bye. Thanks. Have a nice lunch. Yeah,